welcome to Let's Talk About the Middle East. I'm Andy Blanche. And I'm Juliana Michelle. On this show, we talk about the Middle East. It's culture, politics, religion, history, just about anything that captures the complexity of the region. We hope to promote open and honest discussion about the conflict and in Israel and Palestine and to humanize the conflict by getting to know people who have a stake in the issues. The Finding a Path to Peace series, an educational series on Palestine and Israel, will kick off on Sunday, February 21st at 6 p.m. at the Fogartyville Community Media and Arts Center. That's at 525 Kumquat Court. It will continue on the third Sundays of the month through May. The first session on Sunday, February 21st, will focus on the historical roots of conflict in the Middle East. For information, visit sarasotapeacecenter.org. You are listening to WSLR 96.5 LPFM in Sarasota and WBPV 100.1 LPFM in Bradenton. The opinions and views expressed on Let's Talk About the Middle East are strictly those of the hosts and guests and do not necessarily reflect those of the station manager, the board of directors, or anyone else affiliated with WSLR. Today we'll be interviewing USF Professor Abdel Wahab Hashish from the Department of Government and International Affairs. Dr. Hashish was born in Tunis, Tunisia. He did he graduated he did graduate and postgraduate studies at the University of Paris, Sorbonne Nouvelle. I don't I'm not sure that I pronounced that correctly and the Institute of Advanced International Relations. He is a Dean Rust um, he is a Dean Rusk Seminar Fellow at the Southern Center for International Studies, Atlanta, Georgia, and has been twice a fellow at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies of Harvard University. He has also been honored as a laureate of the Fondation, de, oh my, the Fondation de la Vocation in Paris for his work on peace in the Middle East. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Hashish. Thank you, Ms. Juliana. Um, so, uh, so Professor Hashish, um, you have a very interesting background. I see that you were born in Tunisia. Uh, is there anything in your personal story that could help our listeners understand the work you do? Well, if you ask me for something about uh, do we have my Professor connection with Hashish? Tunisia, in my early childhood, I saw World War II when Tunisia was occupied by the Nazi, and I saw the liberation of Tunisia by the U.S. and uh, the U.S. allies. And I remember, if it is really something that is very, very personal, as a little child, I did see the German soldiers looking for Jews, and how my heroic mother as an interpreter for the nurses of the Red Cross, which was just across our house, would stand up and say, we are all Arabish, meaning we are all Arabs, although there were Jews, Christians, Maltese, Italians, hiding in the uh, vestibule, a large hall of the Red Cross, when there were uh, sirens announcing bombing around us. Mm. That's how maybe I began to be interested in, uh, in peacemaking. That's wow. what Tunisia uh, left in my heart and in my mind. Wow. Thank you. That's such an interesting background to be approaching all of this from. And so we want to ask uh, some questions about some uh, recent events going on in USF. Uh, and you're a professor at USF. Last month, the Student Senate at USF Tampa um, passed a joint resolution calling on the Board of Trustees of the USF Foundation to divest from corporations involved in Israel's occupation and human rights violations. What are your thoughts on this move by the student body? Well, as a teacher, as an educator, I am always happy to see our students and students on any, on any campus get involved in uh, debates, even when the debates are ideologically uh, motivated, that's, 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 that's what is the role of a campus. Mm -hmm. But 
when the issue was brought to my attention, even in a classroom, and probably by some students who were uh, part of the movement on, on USF campus in Tampa, I disagreed with them, respectfully, humbly, because if I want to believe I am a peacemaker, and I know that when I went to Israel on a few occasions, the, I heard and I saw many Israeli scholars, generals, politicians, who defended the rights and the dignity of the Palestinians better than some Arab, Arab state leaders. I could not see this BDS, right? It is the boycott, divest, and sanctions. Right. It will, it will prolong the, the difficulties we are watching today in the peace process. Mm. And I prefer that there would be more creative ways to resuscitate the dialogue between Israeli and Palestinian leaders in particular, and Israeli and Arab leaders in general, to, to promote peace more than to continue to make the Israeli government and the Israeli people more isolated. Interesting. So, and uh, there is a group affiliated with USF called Peace House. It's an, an activist production group formed last year in Tampa, and they released a video uh, celebrating the passing of the resolution and also explaining uh, uh, the the bill that's that's passing through the Florida legislature right now that's targeting BDS. Um, so I'm going to play a little bit of the video, and then if you don't mind, you can give us uh, your reaction. Thank you. One second here. Oh, let me get this set up in the right way. Doesn't seem to be working. One second. And we're going to play the video right now. But it's not happening. So, individuals, businesses, churches, and public institutions around the world are saying they will not buy or invest in companies profiting from human rights violations. Enough is enough. It's a simple but powerful idea, and it's worked before in South Africa, during the U.S. civil rights era, and against fossil fuel companies. Israel is starting to feel the pressure, but instead of responding by addressing human rights violations, they're making a great effort to undermine democracy and hold up a giant middle finger to the First Amendment. We have money. Just tell us how much you need. This is APAC. We just want your support. If you want to get elected for president or pretty much any public office, you need to be friends with this guy. We have the votes. He's working very hard behind the scenes, paying off senators to get his new bill passed. So how does it work again? I'm glad you asked. If you boycott Israel, the government's going to boycott you. So that's just one small clip of a video that was released by Peace House called Stop Joe's Bill, uh, urging uh, viewers to uh, stop the bill that's going through the Florida legislature. What are your thoughts on the message uh, and the approach conveyed in this video? Miss Juliana, professionally and uh, as a human being, when I look at conflicts, I do my best to look at the whole picture. Very recently, only a matter of a couple of weeks, I was very happy to learn that there were some young Israeli individuals who were helping Palestinians replant olive trees for the olive trees that had been destroyed by settlers depriving the poor Palestinian owners of their livelihood. So this is how and why I try to see the two sides' mistakes and the two sides' good, positive initiatives. It is difficult to blame only one side and think that each side is, is better than the other or more rightful than the other. That's my reaction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're and, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, speaking of sides, so this, uh, the release of this video sort of started a dialogue and a response to, uh, from the, the Jewish Federation of, of Sarasota and Manatee, they, uh, they distributed a message to its membership saying that, uh, as, as a response to this video, saying that groups like CARE, which is the Council on American Islamic Relations, Students for Justice in Palestine, and Muslim Student Association, and the Jewish Voices for Peace are, and others are the new anti-Semites. 
Uh, do you agree that, that these groups, these pro-Palestine groups, are, are the new anti-Semites? I really cannot, cannot uh, have a clear answer about this because I know that sometimes it has been very easy for some Jews individual or Jewish circles to accuse anyone of anti-Semitism. As, as a journalist, you know that in the recent difficult debate about uh, the Iranian uh, deal, a nuclear deal, uh, even uh, the President of the United States was accused of being anti-Semite by some people. I, therefore, uh, I would not uh, fall into that trap, you know. It is a trap. It is dangerous. It's delicate. Mm -hmm. People can disagree politically on the most sensitive issues without necessarily becoming accused of uh, anti-Semitism uh, anti, uh, anti or uh, uh, Islamophobia and so on. It is a very, very difficult issue, and I personally try to make sure I don't get involved in something that is sometimes not relevant. Mm -hmm. um, can I, this, is, um, this is Andy, the co-host here, and um, I, I want to ask a follow-up question. Please? Um, because it is a very sensitive issue, and uh, I, I, I'm wondering if you have any advice to folks who are active in, in this Israeli-Palestinian set of issues, uh, how to handle it if they are operating from good faith and they get accused of being anti-Semitic? I had students throughout the years, and they have been at USA for a long time. Sometimes I had Middle Eastern students from Arab countries, and sometimes from Israel. And I try as a teacher, I like very much the word you use, the expression good faith. If I make them understand the importance of negotiating and dialoguing in good faith, I assure you, I saw miracles. Mm. I saw a, a, a very a non-conventional Israeli student, Israeli, uh, not, not American Jew, an Israeli citizen, who had been in two wars as an Israeli, young Israeli citizen, he told me. At the end, he, he, wanted, he was ready to give up Jerusalem. <laughs> okay? so That's a big give. <laughs> it is a big deal. But at least, even because I was then an advisor to the USF model United Nations, and then we had uh, the model uh, conference for the, uh, the League of Arab States. So when we play the role of diplomacy, but understand the position of the other, and understand, therefore, this important notion of good faith, not to trick the other one, not to outsmart the other one. This is how people can begin to trust one another. It is a, the, the, the famous slogan, I think, from President Reagan uh, with Gorbachev, uh, trust but verify. Yeah. So yes, it is a very sensitive, and we, as humble teachers, educators, we are not officials, we have to instill that notion of opening up sincerely, honestly, in order to understand the other. Okay, so developing trust, and um, trying to find common ground and meeting people as hum human beings um, rather than jumping into a blame game is what, I, uh, what I'm hearing you say. And, uh, you, you are Andy, you said your name? Yes. Miss Andy. You know, I had the privilege, I, I had for me, it was a divine privilege to be invited to join the first U.S. delegation for peace in the Middle East run by the U.S. Interreligious Committee for Peace with rabbis, uh, priests, and some Muslims. It was my first trip, to official trip to, to Israel and Palestinian territories and other Arab states. That's where I really felt that peace was really possible because there are Israeli and Palestinian who are committed to this idea of peace, and they, have, they are still struggling, but there are also enemies of peace. There is no doubt there are enemies of peace on both sides. And that's what we have. It is the challenge for the true peacemakers, both Israeli and Palestinian. 
Yeah, we, we want to hear a little more about your interfaith um, peace work in a minute. But before we go there, yes. uh, I read an editorial by Thomas Friedman um, in The Times this week. And in this editorial, he said bluntly that the peace process is dead. He then went on to state that the, new, the next U.S. president will have to deal with the fact that, and I'm quoting, Israel is determined to permanently occupy all the territory between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, including where 2.5 million West Bank Palestinians live. Do you agree with um, Thomas Friedman's assessment? Mr. Thomas Friedman is a distinguished uh, journalist, and we learn a lot from his reporting. I like reading his columns. He visited USF some years ago. I think he must have been, uh, he must have lost faith. And it is understandable. It happens to me sometimes to lose faith. But I don't think it would be the best, the best solution should Israel under any, any, any leadership, Likud or Labour or any other party, because it will be insensible to imagine that after all these efforts, after all these hopes and accidents, somebody can still dream in Israel to occupy the rest of Palestine. I am a believer, and maybe in your follow-up questions, I can give you more detail. I am a believer in Resolution 242 of November 1967. And I can elaborate and explain it. So, no, it is not reasonable to let anyone dream of eliminating the rights of Palestinians for self-determination. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and just for our listeners, can you um, can you uh, elaborate on Resolution Two Four Two? Okay. At a certain time, you know, I spent a short time in the United Nations, and people at a certain time later would call me uh, Mr. Resolution Two Four Two. <laughs> Resolution Two Four Two has a preamble, and because. Andy, a while ago, when I, I, I appreciated Andy's uh, reference to the notion of good faith, one of my professors of international law left that in my mind forever. Good faith is the best tool in negotiations. In the preamble of Resolution 242, it is said that the UN does not recognize territories occupied by force. And this idea goes back to, to an American uh, uh, statesman uh, between the two wars, World War I and World War II. I believe it, it goes back to the notion of uh, the Stimson uh, Doctrine when, when uh, uh, Japan uh, occupied Manchuria. So it is a principle today. We do not recognize the occupation of any territory by force. And then what the weakness of Resolution 242 was that there was not even the word Palestine or Palestinians. They only referred to refugees. So I proposed years ago that should Resolution 242 be amended, be supplemented when the PLO became a reality and we had the beginning of the Oslo peace process, which was celebrated at the White House on September the 13th, 1993, Maybe that will be, legally speaking, politically and diplomatically, a correction, a supplement to make the idea of the two-state solution more, more, uh, more achievable, more feasible. And that's why we had many moments when we thought, that's it, the U.S., Israel, the PLO did commit themselves for a two-state solution. But it is dormant right now. It is very dormant, but it is not dead. So Hopefully it is not dead, which would be my disagreement respectfully with Mr. Thomas Friedman. Right. And um, you, you said that, that Thomas Friedman, you think, has lost, lost hope or lost faith in the peace process. I think... Uh, a lot of a lot of folks, at least in this country, have or are starting to lose faith uh, faith in the peace process. Um, 
I think that's a, a good segue to the work that you do with interfaith dialogue. Can you talk about why you think interfaith dialogue is important uh, and what relationship that might have to maintaining faith that, that there's a possible fair outcome? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is how I evolved as a human being, as, uh, an intel in, as a teacher, as an intellectual, let's say, if I can use the word. I used to, my, my, my education is essentially uh, based on the French system, the French values. I had great professors, both in Tunis and then in Paris. So I political scientist. Hello? Hello? Are, yep. are you still there? I still have you. You're Sorry? Good. Yep, you're good. Yeah. So I use whatever I learned about political science, international law, morality, and so on, philosophy. And suddenly, since the mid-60s, we hear more and more that international relations now are being affected with religion. Mm. That religion now is replacing politics that religiosity is replacing nationalism, especially in the Middle East. Then I'd be, okay, let's learn this issue. Let's try to see what we can do if we understand better religion. And it was there that I said, how come? If in Islam, the fundamentals of Islam are really around the notion of peace, salam, which is very close to the Hebrew shalom. And it was that way, and thanks to the education I received from my parents and my, my teachers in Tunisia, my teachers were Jews, Muslims, Christians, that I, I, I said, okay, let's go so that we can counter this new fanaticism with solid religious uh, precepts from the holy books. So I had the privilege, and I tell you, you mentioned you are in Sarasota, and I'm seeing to Sarasotans. My real turning point in interfaith started with the Sarasota chapter of the American Jewish Committee. Rabbi Rudin is very well known in Sarasota. And uh, destiny led me to meet him. With him, I went to Germany. Then through him also, I, I had the, 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 the pleasure, the, the privilege to meet uh, people of the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. Dr. Hartman made me uh, a special guest there and asked me to review and present my, my understanding, my analysis of his book on uh, Israeli and the Jewish people, a young nation. Uh, no, an old, an old uh, nation debating its, its future. So I was lucky to meet people of goodwill among Christians, Jews and Muslims, Palestinians and Israelis as well. Great scholars, theologians from the Harvard Divinity School like Dr. King. Frankly, and I, I consider myself still a student. I'm still learning. I'm still digging, trying to find a way to demonstrate that this story, this new story that Jews hate Arabs, Arabs hate Jews, is not correct. It is being exploited. I had the privilege to attend the first Congress, Imams and Rabbis for Peace. It was supposed to be held in Morocco, but they changed the venue. It was co-sponsored by the King of Morocco and then the King of Belgium. It was held in, in and I assure you that to see Orthodox Israeli rabbis hugging Muslim imams from all over the world, we, we knew that it was true, it was possible. And the, in, the final, in the final report, we said that Islam had been hijacked. And I still believe that today with the story about ISIS and the barbaric acts of beheading and so on, those things must be combated with ideas. And I believe the U.S. government, the U.S. State Department, is beginning to be aware of this. We cannot win any war only with tanks and bombs. We have to fight ideas with ideas. Thank you. So 
we're very excited. You're going to be talking at Fogartyville on February 21st during our first program of the Path to Peace series. Your topic is historical roots of the conflicts in the Middle East. Can you give us a sense of what we'll be hearing from you that evening? Well, thank you, thank you. I will be trying to share with you whatever I have been learning so far. And I can assure you I am still learning a lot. Most of the weekends I spend at the library. Uh, I will try to share with you, but humbly, as a dialogue, through a dialogue. I will not be lecturing like uh, in a classroom and try to show you what may have been indeed the roots of the, of the problem of today, although people, and this is something I would like to, 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 to combat, that Jews and Muslims have hated one another for centuries. Yes, there have been issues, but the essence of my belief and my optimism is that Jews and Muslims had a wonderful, peaceful cohabitation. And from Jewish circles, Jewish sources, the golden age of Judaism <coughs> also took place in Andalusia, in Spain, when Islam was ruling Spain. Why suddenly today I have to believe, or anyone should be led to believe, that Jews and Muslims hate one another? This is, this is my humble way of rediscovering the truth in order to build a genuine and reasonable degree of optimism for peace. Hmm. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Hashish. Is there a way for listeners to reach you or to learn more about your work? Well, I, uh, Miss Juliana, I tell you in all sincerity, when my, uh, my daughter, a kid, a teenager, tells me stories about what is written about me, I don't know anything about what is written <laughs> about me. Whatever is written is written by the university. But uh, they can contact me. My name is, uh, is uh, as an employee of the University of South Florida. My email is there. And uh, when I meet you on the 21st, I hope I will uh, make some references to what I have written or published recently. Great. Thank you. And if you want to learn more about Let's Talk About the Middle East, give us feedback or share ideas for topics or speakers, you could find us on Facebook. Just search Let's Talk About the Middle East or go to facebook.com slash talk East. You could also listen to this interview and others on our podcast site. The, uh, the URL is talkmideast.podomatic.com. Uh, Thank you. And if you are interested in hearing more from Professor Hashish about the historical roots of conflict in the Middle East and about all the other topics we covered today, don't forget to join us at Fogartyville on February 21st. Other sessions following the 21st session will focus on anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and all the ways we turn an entire group into the other, the impact of growing separation between Israelis and Palestinians, and the interfaith peace movement. It's going to be a lively series, so come if you can. Our theme music is from Merkava by the Israeli musician and peace activist Gabby Myers. Take care and spread the peace. Thank you, all of you, and congratulations for your show. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Professor. Looking forward to, to meeting you on the 21st. Very good. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye-bye.